Hello. In this video, I want to talk to you about a classic syndrome in neurology and neuroanatomy. And this is the brown saccade syndrome, um, or alternatively known as cord hemisection syndrome. And brown saccade syndrome arises from transection of just one half of the spinal cord. And a caveat I want to get across immediately is that in real life, what I'm going to tell you doesn't really exist because uh, in real life, the lesion that I'm going to talk about um, is way too perfect to happen in real patients. In real patients, we will see some aspects of this syndrome, but, but not necessarily all of them. However, the lessons that we can learn from this um, can be very, very valuable in helping us to appreciate what's going on with the spinal cord. And I would argue that if you can competently explain all of the features of brown saccard syndrome, you have an excellent working knowledge of how the spinal cord works. So let's start off. Let's start by drawing um, a cross section of the spinal cord, as I frequently do. Um, it's a very, going to be a very simple cross section of the cord, a transverse section, and it could be at any level. Okay, so all right, here is a transverse section through the spinal cord, and for our purposes in, at the moment, it doesn't matter what level it is at. Here's the central canal, here's the dorsal horn and the ventral horn. Okay. And furthermore, we can add on um, a dorsal root and a ventral root. Okay, so we have a dorsal root with a dorsal root ganglion and a ventral root connecting up with that, and then the two of them coming together to form the spinal nerve. And in brown saccade syndrome, what we have is we have a lesion, which I'm going to use red to show this, which has destroyed one half of the spinal cord. This could be a sharp lesion or a blunt lesion. Um, it doesn't matter so much, but for our purposes, we shall say that it has destroyed a single the one half of a single cord segment. So the extent of the lesion is this, okay? Um, and note that my lesion encompasses not only the spinal cord itself, but also the dorsal and ventral roots, because you, you relatively rarely get something affecting the cord and not the adjoining roots. If I wanted to show you this sort of diagrammatically in a longitudinal view, um, I could draw a kind of a, a cylinder over here on the right hand side. I could draw my midline here. I could say that I've got a number of chord segments. So here's one, two, three, four. Maybe we can even fit um, six chord segments on there. And we'll say that we've got, I don't know, um, C5, C6, C7, C8, T1 and T2. And let's say that our lesion is affecting the C8 spinal cord segment on that one side. So we have a spinal cord hemisection where we'll say the left half of the C8 spinal cord segment has been destroyed. So let's take a think about what is going to be the effect of this lesion. So let's start off by considering uh, the grey matter. Okay, so let's start off by considering the effects on the grey matter. So if we begin with the ventral horn, so in the left half of the C8 spinal cord segment, the entirety of the ventral horn will have been destroyed. And so what you should remember, of course, is that the ventral horn contains the cell bodies of lower motor neurons, which are going to then distribute out through the ventral roots into the C8 myotome, okay? And in destroying the left half of the C8 cord segment, we will have destroyed the ventral horn of the left half of the C8 cord segment, meaning that we would see lower motor neuron effects in the left C8 myotome. Okay? 
So we've destroyed the ventral horn on the left-hand side at the level of C8, meaning that we're going to see a lower motor neuron syndrome in the left C8 myotome. So that's easy enough to understand. Also, of course, we've destroyed the ventral roots on that side as well for that spinal cord segment, which would have exactly the same effect, disconnecting the motor neurons from their muscles. What about the dorsal horn? So, on the left side, the C8 dorsal horn has been destroyed in its entirety as well. And thinking about the C8 dorsal horn, the C8 dorsal horn is collecting uh, pain, um, temperature and crude touch from the C8 dermatome. So the C8 dermatome is going to be, um, to have lost the spinothalamic modalities because the dorsal horn has been destroyed at that level. All right. So let's start listing these. Okay. So we're going to see um, left-sided lower motor neuron features in the C8 myotome. Okay. We're going to see left-sided loss of um, spinothalamic modalities in the C8 dermatome. Okay. And because we have involved the dorsal roots on the left side at C8, we're also going to see loss of dorsal column modalities um, for the C8 dermatome of, as well. So we're going to see left-sided loss of dorsal column modalities um, in the C8 dermatome as well. Okay, so because we've lost both spinothalamic and dorsal column modalities in this left-sided C8 dermatome, the C8 dermatome on the left-hand side is rendered entirely um, anaesthetic. So that's the effect on our um, grey matter as well as the dorsal and ventral roots. So now let's consider the effect on the long tracts. And the first long tract we need to think about is, of course, the dorsal column pathway. So let's think about the dorsal column pathway. And if we look at the image on the right-hand side, the longitudinal view, of course, dorsal column axons are running ipsilaterally. And these would be ascending, 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 and would have then become interrupted by our lesion on the left side at the level of C8. And what that means, therefore, is that from the level of C8 down, on the same side as the, of the lesion, we're going to see loss of dorsal column modalities. Okay, We've already explained why we've lost um, dorsal column modalities at the level of C8, but then below it, we have also lost dorsal column modalities because that information cannot get up past that lesion. Okay, So, in this case, we're going to see... Um, left-sided loss of dorsal column modalities from C8 downwards, okay? We've explained why specifically at C8, and we've just explained why below C8 will be affected as well. Now, let's have a think about the spinothalamic system. Now, the spinothalamic system um, is slightly different um, with, uh, than the dorsal column system in terms of the trajectory of its axons. And this results in um, it being a little more complicated for us to understand. The second thing about the spinothalamic system is that its first order neurons can ascend a couple of segments through the so-called Lissauer's tract. So let me just use a different colour and I'll select um, blue for the spinothalamic system. Um, and this becomes relatively easy for us to understand if we just remember that Lissauer's tract enables these first order neurons of the spinothalamic system to ascend a couple of segments before synapsing. Okay? So let's think of um, an axon here, which is a T2 sensory neuron. This is um, a neuron taking part in the spinothalamic system, so sensitive to pain or temperature. Of course, it has its cell body in the dorsal root ganglion. 
and then this axon enters the spinal cord. And it is then able to ascend within Lissauer's tract. It's able to ascend two or three segments, all right? So if you look here now, this axon can ascend Lissauer's tract, a couple of segments, before synapsing upon a second order sensory neuron. Having synapsed on its second order sensory neuron, the second order neuron then decussates and runs in the spinothalamic tract all the way up to the brain. So what we've been able to do here is show how it is the case that the loss of spinothalamic modalities actually sits at a lower level than the loss of dorsal column modalities. Okay, so in this case, um, we would see a right-sided loss of spinothalamic modalities. Spinothalamic modalities. Um, and that would be from something like the level of um, T3 downwards. T2 or T3 downwards. T2 or T3 downwards. Okay? And that is down to the fact that Lissauer's tract enables these first order axons to ascend a couple of segments. So we've considered the effects on the motor and sensory systems, but let's not forget the other systems that are running through the spinal cord. And what I'm particularly referring to is the autonomic system. So remember that particularly within the lateral funiculi of the cord, we have axons originating from the hypothalamus and the reticular formation descending down through the cord and having their action on autonomic preganglionic neurons either within the thoracic or the sacral levels of the cord. So in this Lissauer's tract, if we destroy one half of the cord, that means that we would effectively deprive one half of, say, the pelvic viscera from input from the autonomic nervous system. So hemisection of the cord could indeed have quite a significant impact upon the functions of the pelvic organs. That would be an impact on micturition, on faecal continence and on sexual function. So I hope that this has been of some use. Um, there can be arguments about how many levels do these axons ascend. Um, uh, that doesn't really matter. You know, what I'm trying to communicate to you is that the presence of Lissauer's tract um, means that these axons, some of these axons do indeed ascend a couple of segments and that just explains why the sensory level for spinothalamic modalities is lower than the sensory level for dorsal column modalities. Okay, thank you very much for listening.